the beginning of the year, the school year period comprised only one super hive. The members of the Queen's College Beekeeping Society were determined to expand the apiary and accordingly started a new hive from the old one. After a few months, the members were able to put on a, su a super on the second hive and also to start a new one. As the hives increased in numbers, new members were enrolled who displayed great keenness. These members were split up into pairs and trained to look after a hive. Meetings were held every Friday for the purpose of teaching new members the theoretical and practical science of beekeeping and also for noting the progress of comb building. An extraction was made from the first hive, which yielded 22 pounds of honey. This hive contained 10 frames in the soup. At the end of November, the apiary comprised two super hives, each holding 20 frames and one brood of eight frames. We regret that her financial status does not allow for the purchase of an extractor, but we hope that the situation will soon improve in the near future, that we will be able to possess an extractor before the year is out. In this respect, the society owes a great debt of gratitude to A. A. Bell Esquire and Alexander Chin Esquire, who so kindly assisted us at harvest time with the loan of their extractors. <laughs> Listening to the Land, poem by Martin Carter, which I have attempted to encapsulate in a musical form. Of course, uh, music, poetry, and music go together. As a matter of fact, the first poems are very much musical, musical in form, very early, early poems, and then later on things got complicated. So <laughs> Poem of Prison by Martin Carter. Now I go back to night, O dark slab of iron, wall of brick, O lonely window, face me not with heaven. I go back, I return, I sink into the floor. 
Life, wherever you are, I hail you. When my heart is ready, shall blaze away. This prison will be a mound of ashes. I will be born. I will be born, my love. Unwritten histories of human hearts. Who knows, one day the books will write themselves in magic language, soon transforming us to image, symbol, and the ultimate silence. My hand grown weary on a truthful page and stops at last in total resignation. Shall it be told, I seek the quiet answer to this first question, which began it all. For thousands of miles, the sky is all the same, just like the sea or time or loneliness. It was the heart that noticed all of this when it computed distance into loss. The sky bends with the earth and earth with space and those who navigate are full of hope. But the compass that they need is far more kind than love's magnetic north pole of desire. I will walk across the floor through tables, through voices like a man who is very drunk. I will think only of the moment, abolishing time's furniture, I will make myself my own. A high roof with rafters whereupon I'll hang like a bat. Flitting through twilight by trees that are going to sleep, I will disappear into the flame of sunset of the rim of the sea. Plunging myself into depths that are always dark, I will see all things and return to tell you all. Using the speech of men, I will whisper to you of dreams that change to ghosts and haunt your life. And prayers in the heart that mutilate, I will repeat until your eyes are streaming. I will always be speaking with you. And if I falter, and if I stop, I will still be speaking with you. In words that are not uttered, are never uttered, never made into the green sky, the green earth, the green, green love. And I was bathing by the sea, and there was a gull, a white gull, so far, so far. I saw the weak wing flutter long before it did, and the webbed foot dip long before it did, and the sudden wave and the scarlet tinted foam of a sunset burning like fire, already gold in flames. Mm -hmm. Wanting to write another poem for you, I searched the world for something beautiful. The green crown of a tree offered itself because its leaves were combed just like your hair. The sea wind brushes and the light rains wash and crystal jewels cling to every twig while ten other tears in lover's eyes sleep all those tiny blossoms yet to bloom. Outside my window, 
law unto itself. This tall green crown confirms an oath I swore with mighty roots invisible in earth and amongst seeds that war with God and die. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just for those who may or may not know Daddy, he wrote on anything that was near at hand. He always had paper and pen nearby. Um, and he wrote as his thoughts came to him. So what I'm going to be reading is not a written piece, but just ideas as he entered them on pieces of paper. All of the writings are from the year 1963, which was the year of the race riots in Guyana. And uh, one thing I can say is that he despised injustice and was deeply troubled by the suffering of all the races of Guyana, in Guyana. The point is never to lose sight of one's identity, but to keep returning, returning in spite of everything and anything to the truth of one's being. My mental agony and spiritual distress. What a horror has life become and what makes it bluntly unendurable is the clarity, the nakedness with which I see everything. For people like us, marooned in misery and with naked roots, everything must be raw material, awaiting transformation. The drunk man, dazed in a gutter, the criminal damned in a cell, the priest happy in his celibacy, the merchant hypnotized with profit, the politician blind with power, the mother paralyzed with her child's end, the lover ecstatic with freedom. We must accept all of these as those who constitute the stuff of an experience, the natural order, the given universe, out of which we must create what we want. We are caught between a slave past and a future whose values are not rooted in any tradition, but biological necessity. Thus behind us the slave, before us, the naked animal. Nor has our history, education, prepared us for the encounter in the modern world, just as the Western civilization had not prepared France, England, etc., for Nazism. Mm -hmm. I'm supposed to be speaking on the people of British Guyana. Before I start, however, to chronicle facts or to draw conclusions or to suggest ideas, I think I can point out that in any discussion on human, of human affairs, of any discussion involving human relations, the greatest difficulty always is in semantics. In other words, the meaning of meaning bedevils every attempt in which men try to communicate ideas of feeling to other men. And unless we get our meanings right, unless we get on the safe wavelengths with those whom we speak, we shall always find ourselves at cross purposes. Now, the best way for me to start is to attempt what I would like to describe as a short sociological record of my country. Now it's impossible, totally impossible, to understand any part of the West Indies and particularly British Guiana, unless you understand slavery. And by slavery, I mean plantation slavery. All of you are aware of the meaning of the word slavery in the sense 
that you would know that the economy of territories of the Caribbean was once founded on sugar plantation slavery. And thus, in order for these plantations to operate and survive, it was necessary to bring slaves from Africa to these territories. It is my contention that the relationship with obtains between the master on one hand and the slave on the other is most essential to an understanding, firstly, of the social structure of my country, and secondly, of the psychological structure of the people who live in that country. Now, let us quickly see whether we can isolate one or two relevant facts. The first one is that the master was European. That is to say, a human being with certain obvious physical characteristics, and the most important of, of which was the color of the skin. The second important fa fact was the physical characteristic of the slave, another human being with a particular color of skin. On the plantation, therefore, you have on one hand a white master and a black slave. Now, as you know, on a plantation, the master in those days at least held power over life and death over his slaves, his cattle. Of course, today, no shackles weigh down the hands and feet of men in our times, but this does not mean that the shackles have fallen from the spirit. The visible shackles have gone, but the invisible shackles remain. Further, in the days of slavery, color was associated with the physical conditions to which they have already alluded, and in the minds of slaves. As a consequence, in the eyes of the people who are the majority on the sugar plantations, power and being white were associated. And this, I think, to a great extent served to set the pattern for the whole social history, not only of British Guiana, but the whole of the Caribbean. With the bringing of the indentured immigrants from India, the slave owners, erstwhile slave owners, hit the jackpot because the Indian peasants whom they recruited from India were found to be suitable for work on, frit, on sugar estates. And from 1838 until 1917, indentured immigration from India to British Guyana continued without stopping. And by the time it had come to an end, British Guyana had been transformed from a country in which you had originally the master and the slave into a country which you had people of six racial groups existing and living side by side. A popular cliche adopted by many, many journalists is to call British Guiana the land of six peoples. Of course, it sounds elegant in some people's ears, and I suppose this is the reason why it's, it's so often used. But as I said, it is a cliche because the people in British Guiana have not yet really become a people. Mm -hmm. From a particular position, it seems more than ordinarily useful to think of poems as codes. Every time someone construes a true poem, he makes one. He completes, as it were, the poet's breaking into the chain. Every proper reading is also another kind of completion. But every proper reading is only as significant as the original code is significant, which is as much to say that the code itself is a true poem. A code is something based on mutuality. Hence the following poem. Star code and tree fruit shout in the throat of the music of my loss. Rain. The nymph of a grasshopper laughs. Flood surrounds the fence of the heron's knotted ankle. Cattle, man, or beast of water. When I tried, I touched. When I touched, I found myself. The frail odor of love waits for strong fingers. This coat of stars has been a long time waiting. And when my feet scuttle, the leaves of trees talk. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm.
So the When Time is the title that Martin Carter gave to a series of new poems that appeared in the 1977 collection, Poems of Succession. And unlike um, Poems of Resistance, we actually know quite a lot about how this collection came to be. In 1969, CLR James wrote to Martin Carter and he said these words, I hope you have not entirely abandoned the writing of poetry, but CLR James needn't have worried because Carter was thinking about poetry in this period. And around this time, he was talking to John LaRose, the um, Trinidadian writer, activist and publisher about um, putting together a new collection, which would be a retrospective of his work. In 1970, Otter and John LaRose agreed that they would publish a new piece of work and Aubrey Williams delivered the manuscript to John LaRose in London. Aubrey was also ready to do the front cover, although this never happened. And what we have is instead the plain red rust cover that Martin Carter said he would prefer. The book was intended to be called Poems 1970 to 1950. Another possible title was Deeds 1970 to 1950. And you'll notice the, the dates there. And at this time, Carter was really interested in the idea of thinking about a reverse chronology for his work. Then five years passed and a collection never appeared. Things only got back on track when Martin Carter went to the University of Essex as a visiting fellow, and then work began again on the collection. And by this time, there was a load of new poems for them to think about and to include. But in 1977, Poems of Succession was published, and with it were the poems for the when time, which took up now a third of this new collection. Poems of Succession has been described by Rupert Rupnarain as a set of poems of private wonder. And its poetic range progresses, I think, from that sense of the personal into quite complicated senses of affiliation. Perhaps because of the dense linguistic possibility in the phrase, the when time, we could view the whole collection as a journey into language, not as a retreat from the world, but as a way to think about how, as humans, we need to make sense and understand the world. And that phrase, the when time, deserves our attention too. When we ask the question, when, what we are often doing is trying to find out what is going to happen at a particular time. We also use that word to determine events from the past. We can ask when in a hopeful way, but we can also ask it in frustration. And so the phrase, the when time, frames all of Carter's poems in quite an open and challenging way. And Carter's poetic interests and successes in this series of poems are really wide ranging from grammatical experimentations to his continued concerns to be thinking about, but not confined to thinking about Guyanese society and Guyanese topography. In these poems, I think we find Carter experimenting with the language of poetry and people and place and the losses and the joys that that can bring. <laughs> Words. Every so often Carter would write poems about being a poet and The Poems Man is maybe one of the most familiar poems in that kind of vein, but we can also see it in his earliest writings as well. In To a Dead Slave, for example, the craft of writing is prominent in the opening lines. This poem, Words, was first published in Kaikoveral in 1957. And it's one of the first poems that's also included in that series, The When Time. And so in some respects, it sets the stage for the later poems. What strikes me about this poem is that repetition of the phrase, these poet words. 
and the metaphors of poetry that Carter creates for us. The idea of poetry that emerges in this poem stresses the messy, mysterious and transformative qualities of poetic language. Poetry is in Carter's words, and I'm quoting him now, nuggets out of corruption, jewels dug from dung, or speech born from the flesh of experience still bloody red. Also, we might pause again on the phrases that Carter uses, the poet words that he uses to begin each verse are really interesting because what are we to make of those words? In some ways, it makes poetry seem possibly kind of plain and simple, but Carter's metaphors are dense and difficult. The making of poetry clearly has its costs for the poet. You don't just pick up these poet words as if they're like words on the ground. These are, poem, these are poems and poet words that are created through the great pressures of human experience, the great pressures of world experience. When Carter writes about the world's confusion or about the agony of the earth's complaint. And the poem ends with almost a riddle or an aphorism. And it might be useful to listen to Carter's final couplet alongside the biblical words of Matthew. In Matthew, we have, and I will give to you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And Carter takes up this imagery of keys and locking and unlocking at the end of the poem, but he takes it in his own different direction. These poet words, nuggets out of corruption, or jewels dug from dung, or speech from flesh still bloody red, still half afraid to plunge into ceaseless waters foaming over death. These poet words, nuggets no jewel sells across the counter of the world's confusion, but far and near, internal or external, burning the agony of Earth's complaint. These poet words have secrets locked in them, like nuggets laden with the younger sun. Who will unlock must first himself be locked. Who will be locked must first himself Unlock. In a Georgetown journal, the Jamaican writer Andrew Solkey wrote about meeting Carter, who was then Minister of Information and Culture. And Solkey wrote in his journal this Carter's words were tellingly chosen, his person, a gentle, tall, big man a poet who may yet do a very serious injury to the sterile vocabulary and syntax of bureaucracy. I felt then that if he did succeed in giving something new to the style of his particular ministerial responsibility, not only would it subvert the standard image of the other ministries for the better, but he would have emerged as the pioneer rediscoverer of the long lost beating heart in anybody's politics. So Solkey suggests that Carter's poetic sensibilities might be able to alter Guyanese, maybe even regional ways of understanding politics. But in many ways, it was an ambitious um, thought. And not long after the two men met, Carter resigned as minister. After his resignation, Carter's return to Booker's made front page news. And the period also marked a return to publishing poetry, which Carter hadn't done during this period while minister, but not visibly or publicly had he been releasing poetry. The first poem that was published was Occasion, which many of us know better as A Mouth Is Always Muzzled. It appeared in Georgetown's Sunday Graphic in early 1971, and then again in the magazine Savico. And the poem was quickly interpreted as a statement on Carter's resignation. He, though, consistently denied that it was an intentional link, 
describing it to me as a general statement and arguing that he had written it before, long before his resignation. In Poems of Succession, it's dated 1969. And adding to the story, Al Crichton also found, found out that the poem wasn't published at the poet's instigation at all, but by the journalist Ricky Singh acting quite on his own initiative. The poem, when we read it, squares the barriers or tries to square the barriers to truthful expression with living a good life. And so we have the famous line, a mouth is always muzzled by the food it eats to live. And we move from the idea of being muzzled or silenced to the idea of life as a question that we must all answer as we live. The importance of questions and questioning was a constant in Carter's thinking. And in 1990, he returned to these final lines, writing in one of his notebooks about these ideas and included an additional thought. He wrote this, poetry, a way of surviving. If life is the question asking what is the way to die, poetry is the question asking what is the way to live. A mouth is always muzzled by Martin Carter. In the premises of the town dwells the anarchy of the air. In the case of the vision resolution of the purpose and would shout it out differently if it could be sounded plain. But a mouth is always muzzled by the food it eats to live. Rain was the cause of roofs. Birth was the cause of beds. But life is the question asking, what is the way to die? Mm -hmm. Endless Moment World was written in 1970 and we could if we like think of it as another poem written about being a poet um, although I think it's significant that in this poem we don't have the language of poetry poem or poet at all instead this is a poem concerned with language and what it can and can't do for us as humans. Carter's vocabulary is varied in this poem, and we're encouraged to think about language in different ways, as tongue, as speech, as name, grammar, sound, and breath. And against maybe the pragmatic disappointments of a mouth is always muzzled. In this poem, what we find is a speaker thinking about the possibilities of joy. The turn in the poem comes when the poetic speaker realizes he doesn't have to reveal his intentions. And Carter writes this, I romp this endless moment world, returning, reshaping, rejoicing. There's a lot to unpack here. And I'll leave you with maybe questions. So what is this endless moment world? And how is it related to that earlier phrase, the when time, moment, maybe gets us thinking about brief spells of time, but the word endless pulls in another way, returning us to thinking about ideas of continuity that comes up in the title Poems of Succession. And there is also something really playful and energetic about the alliteration of returning, reshaping and rejoicing. The word world appears a lot in Carter's poetry from his earliest works to his um, last poems. And one of his most famous lines is, I do not sleep to dream, but dream to change the world. Sometimes I think in his work, world seems to refer to a human centered vision of life. So the world as people. Sometimes it feels more like a synonym for the earth and the idea of the connectedness of all the things on the planet. The final paradoxical image of endless moment world falls maybe into that second way of understanding the word. Carter imagines an almost new kind of being made of wind, bird and fish that can survive or even thrive in this place where breathing is hard. Endless moment world would have turned to anyone to see 
that my tongue was ready. Would even have turned to silence if speech had permitted it. But finding out I had to tell to all what my intention was, learn to wherefore certain things are done and just for so, but in my name. Yes, would have turned to anyone and worked with a different hand. Would even have tried with a grammar for the language of the unspeakable. But knowing now, I need not tell at all what my intention is. I romp this endless moment world, returning, reshaping, rejoicing. And would not have turned to myself if language were only sound, nor would have made use of the breath if wind itself were voice. So living where to breathe is hard. I fly like a fish in the air and swim like a bird in the water. And gill stays gill and lung stays lung. And my fin and my wing help each other. At this time, it was written in 1970. Mm -hmm. And at this time, he had a lot of things on his mind he wanted to say. And he found it difficult to turn to persons whom he thought he could trust. 1970 was a time in the Ganavan, they were just changing to the Republican status. And he was changing his political leanings at that time too. And um, he had so many things to say and he did not want to go here or there and say it. So he kept it to himself. The city, the small city, is presumably Georgetown, although it needn't be. Carter named Georgetown only once in the poems that, um, that he wrote, in the devastating revolutionary poem Bastille Day, Georgetown. And I think although we as readers, or certainly I as a reader, might often be tempted to locate his work, it's interesting to note that Carter hardly ever pinned his work down in this way. This is a quiet poem, but its reverberations are profound. Carter was a well-known walker, a walker around Georgetown. And this feels like a poem written by somebody outside rather than somebody inside looking out. We don't often think about Carter in terms of ecological concerns, but I think there is a clear environmental consciousness across all of his work. His work is attuned to maybe what we could call urban nature, and he often attends to it with a microscopic interest. In this poem, we move between beak and claw and hand, and with a real lightness of touch, we recognize the affinities between birds and bats and humans. Carter imagines for us a prehistory of his landscape and the houses, the fragile histories of the places that humans inhabit seem to dissolve in this poem with the dusk. In a small city at dusk by Martin Carter. In a small city at dusk, it is difficult to distinguish bird from bat, both fly fast, one away from the dark, and one toward the dark, the bird to a nest in the tree, the bat to a feast in its branches. Stranger to each other, they seek, planted by beak or claw or hand, the same tree that grows out of the great soil. And I know, even before I came to live here, before the city had so many houses, dusk did the same to bird and bat, and does the same to man. Yeah, I came across this um, this poem, uh, the conjunction, in the year when I was producing, uh, working on a series of paintings, which I call the mini mini series. But in my paintings, I try to use things which are um, life-size in many cases. And um, I worked on it and uh, I finished it, but I gave the series the name 
of the ones I, I did so far, I gave it the name uh, Caribbean Metaphysics. So then um, just before I had the exhibition, I saw Martin's poem, The Conjunction. I said, bloody hell, this, this, this poem resonates with what I'm attempting to do because I'm bringing things together. Um, I thought, in my opinion, that that poem really summed up the work of Martin Clark. If, if, you, if that is possible to sum up the work of Martin Clark in one poem, uh, in my opinion, I thought it did because it was doing two things. One, it was investigating the nature of being. And in the second, it was also um, an exposition on love. What I felt was its affinity to what I was trying to do in my paintings, which are which are um, creates a lot of questions in the mind, and they're intended to do that. They're not. They're not. They're not. Uh, they're not uh, giving you any precise, concise, well-defined sense of order. I began them way back in the eighties, around around nineteen eighty-nine, actually. On um, exactly the time of the writing of this poem, The Conjunction. And to date, I have done um, 156 of those small paintings. A poem entitled The Conjunction, a poem by Martin Carter. Very sudden is the sought conjunction, sought once over and found once over and again in the same sudden place. It is where the hair grows. It is where the hand goes. It is the conjunction of line and the rare possibility of a head on the cushion of hair and love. Indeed, I have always wanted to climb upon the windowsill, to climb and compete with the rain, falling down and rising up and staying still in the promissory hope of passion's signature and the return to wealth of a conjunction. Thank <laughs> you.